Hello, uh, welcome to our webinar uh, sponsored by the German Marshall Fund as well as the American Bar Association. The title of this particular webinar, as you know, is Defund the Police, Dismantle the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Let's discuss a policy approaches to institutional reform. Um, we are thrilled to have a brilliant panel of experts with diverse perspectives on this particular subject matter, um, as well as a skilled moderator um, who I'd like to introduce you to. Mm -hmm. David Johns is the executive director of the National Black Justice Coalition. He's also the former executive director of the White House Initiative on Educational Excellence for African Americans, and he's currently a PhD candidate at Columbia University as well. Um, by now, you should have each received a copy of the Summit Participant Handbook. Um, and that's important because it not only includes the program agenda, but also a fuller biography for each of our moderators as well as our panels. Um, and so I encourage you to refer to that regularly. Um, and that will allow us to use as much of the allotted time as possible for our panelists and moderator to engage in substantive discussion. So on that note, thank you for joining us. And I'd like to turn it over to our moderator, David Johns. David, thank you so much for moderating this important discussion. Important note, unmute yourself. Uh, without question, thank you, NG, for the invitation. Uh, I miss dearly uh, my Tim family. I miss being able to travel. Uh, to the Brussels Forum and doing all of the things that we've done. I should say like all of the memories just came flooded back to me. Um, and so I just wanna acknowledge the foundational uh, and supportive work of Misha and Laura um, and the whole staff who make all of this possible. Uh, for those that have not yet had the pleasure of meeting, encourage you to read the bio, but the thing that I think is most important in this context is that I'm an OG, um, one of the <laughs> earliest participants in town. Uh, and I'm really proud uh, to be connected to so many uh, super thoughtful, uh, incredibly intersectional um, and insightfully uh, engaged leaders uh, working to advance intersectional social justice, radically inclusive intersectional social justice. Um, and so without question, I wanna say thank you to each of you. Um, I'm super excited for us to have a conversation um, with our community um, over the next hour that really acknowledges that in this particular moment, um, in this global movement for Black lives, um, so many, uh, not only conversations, but actions um, connected to this bad ballot cry for recognition of humanity um, has been anchored in calls to defund the police um, or to respond to state-sanctioned violence by abolishing uh, the systems that are often responsible for oppressing um, individuals who come from marginalized and otherwise oppressed communities. Um, and so I have the pleasure of helping to facilitate a conversation that will start um, with three experts and friends. And I encourage you again to read the bios that exist in the handbook that has been shared. Um, I'm not going to read them, um, but I will highlight um, in no particular order um, that I'm super excited for us to be joined by Dr. Clemens. Ajane is a uh, PhD whose research really centers uh, the importance of community-led and informed solutions uh, as it relates to our conversation today. Um, Dr. Jones is a law professor who will help us make some critical connections to how it is that these conversations are anchored in, uh, advanced by and or facilitated, uh, in, in, uh, prohibited is the word I was looking for, um, by the law. Um, and Senator Akbari uh, sits in the space of praxis, uh, where policy meets practice, um, and can help us understand what this looks like from a legislator's perspective um, in her home state of Tennessee. Um, and so what I really want us to be mindful of is that there have been a lot of responses to this call, right, to this question of whether or not we should abolish or defund the police. Um, and do, those two things don't mean the same thing, and they also mean different things to different people. Um, and so I invite each of you in our opening remarks to um, add your definition or color to that. Um, and so we should be clear that in response to this question that, again, has everything to do with local actions to demand defunding local police forces, abolishing U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, or dismantle Homeland Security, that there have been different manifestations across communities. Um, and so while some municipalities are thinking about the work um, that has been led in uh, places like Milwaukee, there have been positive responses. And then in others, there have been legislators who have introduced policies that would otherwise defund those who are attempting to make these demands. 
Um, and so I want to offer up this first question, um, and then I'm going to turn to you, Ajane, to respond to it first. Um, and it's a broad question that includes a couple of parts. But when you think about this topic uh, and the opportunity that exists right now, um, and you think about the importance of research, um, what do you feel is most important for us to know about or follow, particularly as it re relates to legislative efforts to defund the police? Um, who appears to be getting it right? And what does right mean? Um, and who is uh, approaching it in a completely wrong or concerning way? Um, and again, when I think about your research and why I wanted to start with you is because in communities, um, it is really important to collect, contextualize what the research says, right? So that we're being as responsive as possible. Um, and for those who have not had the pleasure of meeting uh, Ajane or reading her bio, which you will want to do, um, her academic research examines the policing of African-American and European Muslim communities um, and the factors that are most important in helping or harming those relationships. Um, and so Doc, uh, acknowledging all of the work that you've done, um, what does the research reveal? Um, and what's absent um, from the research, and then where are the transatlantic uh, lessons to be learned and applied? Well, thank you so much, David. Uh, it's just so great to see you again, uh, my friend, and also uh, Senator Akbari, to see you again. Um, a pleasure to meet you, uh, uh, Professor Jones, and of course, um, NG. Um, and, and, and broader thanks to uh, GMF and the American Bar for having me on, on this important conversation. And I should note, I'm almost there with my doctorate, um, just like May, so. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is really interesting because an interesting question because um, I want to highlight a couple of really exciting models that the research has um, brought to the fore um, that can be put in place under a defunding the police uh, column, if you will. Um, but um, I think it's a very much an open question um, as to whether um, as to as to the the approaches that states have taken or that policymakers have taken um, that get to this sort of um, new the new uh, questions that the defunding the, the police movement raises, which is um, is is reallocating the budget uh, for public safety so much um, that then you could take those monies and apply them to um, to housing, to social services, to mental health supports, to job readiness programs, um, in, in, into you know, vicious cycles of debt and stopping those. I mean, essentially that you've had, you have these, uh, what I would call policy violence um, measures uh, that are allowed to happen or sometimes even facilitated that exacerbate poverty, homelessness, um, you know, these traumas uh, that we know predictably lead to despair, um, uh, discouragement, uh, hopelessness, rage, um, and produce a sort of expected or even predictable amount of that in a community that's then sort of contained and unleashed on itself. So, um, so A, you know, uh, we have the opportunity to, to reverse those policies. Um, and then B, you know, we could um, we could address the the uh, the victims and sort of rehabilitate um, perpetrators, but we also what we typically do now is see, which is just sort of try to identify and punish the perpetrators, and so that's where we focused um, our efforts in policing. And and so back to your question, David. I mean, in terms of uh, states that are even trying to uh, to to address um, uh, any kind of Police, policing reforms, we see some exciting movement coming out of Colorado, um, some attempts coming out of New York. Um, and, um, but frankly, the idea of defunding the police and shifting, reallocating those budgets, um, you know, to these sort of larger policy questions um, is, 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 uh, is still an open question. And, um, and so we know that we can, sh we know that um, it will work. The question I think is, um, you know, can we reallocate that um, enough to to really um, do we need to eventually add more funding beyond what the total policing budget goes? Um, and if so, you know, when does that kick in? How much more is that going to be? Um, and then, and then having being sort of clear eyed about, um, uh, about the cost of that, um, and then doing some very rigorous research to project, um, uh, to project those costs, um, and to frankly, um, 
uh, create, you know, budgets, um, public budgets uh, that will allow, uh, that will serve as models and that will allow governments to look at those, uh, to implement those, and then the public to be a part of, of holding governments accountable for that. But later on, we can get to a couple of the, the, um, the models that research has, has, uh, has highlighted and that deserve yeah. to be replicated. Yeah, I appreciate you laying the foundation there. I want to honor that there's a question in the chat and I want to encourage people to enter questions for the panelists um, and or interventions into the chat. Um, Janine has asked, what does the uh, acronym T-I-L-N stand for? It's the Transatlantic Inclusion Leaders Network. Um, and so we are a part of a network of uh, primarily young elected officials, um, but also policy entrepreneurs. Um, that are thinking about transatlantic connections regarding policy and praxis. Um, and so the abbreviated year is the year that the person participated um, in that network, uh, which includes participating in the Brussels Forum um, and some other stuff. So really encourage you all to learn more about it uh, and find ways to join the network if it sounds like we're talking about you. Um, and again, encourage you to add to the chat. Ajene, again, thank you again for laying that foundation. I wanna name that I heard two key elements when thinking about um, defund efforts. And one is reversing harmful policies. You use the term violent policies, which I love because it describes them exactly as they are. Um, and then reparations uh, by way of resource reallocation. Um, is there another element that's important for us to understand as we think about what um, uh, defund looks like and means? And then the sub question to that is, are there places where people are having conversations that center abolition? Um, they go the step after defund to talk about moving away from uh, police departments in this context. Is that for me? Yes. Um, I think I think in, in in what I've heard in the conversations about abolition, that tends to be more of a longer term goal. I don't. I haven't personally heard of people talking discussing abolition as if it can happen tomorrow. Um, but um, something that if we are, if we take seriously um, the opportunities to drive down uh, violence through, uh, through approaching it as a sort of a public health matter and a, like, almost like an infectious disease or a contagious disease, that, um, that we will have the, event, the opportunity eventually to minimize or sort of right size um, the force itself. Um, so I don't know if that's helpful, but I think that's more of the context in which I've heard of, of abolition. Yeah, very, very, very helpful. And I appreciate you offering up the framing that is uh, uh, used when helping people make connections to defund or abolition um, or this conversation more generally. And it's a perfect segue to uh, Professor Jones, comma, Esquire. Um, and so I want to say we're going to swim in similar waters. In um, a article that you published titled Darkness Made Visible, Law, Metaphor, and the Radical Self, you wrote the unconscious image of Black identity as somehow in opposition to the citizenship idea, the Black as anti-citizen, uh, became the counter story to tell the narrative about equal citizenship that minorities and many others would have liked to tell. Um, and I read this article and really thought about the work that you do in legal context to help us understand the importance of framing. Uh, and what we know in the United States is that so many of the conversations around defunding the police or abolishing the police have been framed by related conversations around race uh, and racism and anti-Blackness. Uh, and they've also been enmeshed in conversations and imagining about the movement for Black Lives and Black Lives Matter. Um, and so Professor Jones, I'd love for you to enter this conversation and make a couple of connections. And so the first is, what are the themes that you have seen be used to inform how it is that we are currently having conversations about abolition? And are there frames that we should be mindful of going forward? Okay. When we think about, uh, one more question, when we think about this as a transatlantic opportunity, right? Uh, a moment for us to be able to work together in community with folks uh, in the EU, are there global lessons that you think should be applied that we in the US might not be mindful of at this moment? Beautiful, beautiful. Well, first let me say I'm honored to be among uh, not merely people who uh, you know, are extremely erudite and educated, but have an extremely sophisticated social consciousness. Uh, you seem to be powerfully aware of the intersections within uh, the problem of racism. And let me try to help, I wanna do the best I can. You have to understand, however, though, I have a, have a point of view. 
I began this, my journey as a scholar 30 years ago. I studied with Derek Bell, with Kimberly Crenshaw, with a number of other brilliant scholars. And one of the things we discussed and one of our starting points was that uh, we, that one way racism, one of the ways racism insinuates itself, it creates false horizons on our thinking. And so we always have to reject or at least be suspicious of the way that uh, questions have been framed for us, and we should develop our, our frames which fit our own experience, our own identity. And so let me start here. You know, for a long time, I thought that the problem was we had a racist criminal justice system. Now, in a sense, we do. And here is the problem. A criminal justice system is a system in which uh, we punish individuals for things that have been identified as crimes. That is what a criminal justice system is in its most basic sense. I teach criminal law. What's interesting is, is that we don't, in my view, at least in the black community, at least since 1982, have what could in any meaningful way be called a criminal justice system. That is not what we have. What we have in the, in the city is, and, and city, in my, 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 most of my work is about the intersection between race and space. Uh, at one point, we talked about class. It's not just class, it's space. It's where you live. Race is not just a question whether you're black or white. It's a question of what, what zip code do you live in? Now, in the inner city, and I grew up in East Baltimore, I don't think you have a criminal justice system. I think what you have is a police regime. And what is the difference between a criminal justice system and a police regime? A police regime doesn't punish. That's not, it may, but it's, that's not its goal. The goal of a police regime is to control dangerous populations. And so, uh, at least since 1982, what police do is they target neighborhoods, communities, and they call them high crime areas. But these are black communities in the inner city, and they target them for military style campaigns. It's not protect and serve, it's search and destroy. They go there to stop, to search, to seize, and to arrest. And the government funds them through the Law Enforcement Systems Administration. They say they don't, but if I can cut through this, they fund them for how many arrests they make. Now, all of this can only exist. How do you have police going into a, a community and treating that community as if they are the enemy, or treating that whole community as a community of criminals? Because that's what we do. But one possible, one part of it is, is that there are a couple of narratives. One narrative is, is that uh, Blacks are presumed guilty, Blacks are presumed dangerous, and more and, and, and intersecting with that is, if you live in a city, you're a part, a, a member of a community of criminals. You put those narratives together and you have at least a moral, a, a logic, a mentality. So part of uh, structural racism is the mentality. The second aspect is the statutes and laws which uh, operationalize that mentality. Uh, and so uh, the mentality is, is that if you live in that community, you are a criminal. You're a mere presence. So one of the things you have, for example, is you have some cities in which uh, they routinely arrest, not on exception, they routinely arrest people in the city without probable cause. Do we think that you're up to no good or we don't like how you're dressed? In Baltimore, they had a lawsuit in which they argued that they systemically arrest people in the inner city without probable cause. They did not contest the case. They settled the case. There was no debate about that. That is what they do. Uh, the, there is no re reasonable suspicion of things that apply in, in communities outside of the inner city. So, the, so there's a constitutional apartheid that is part of our, the normal operation of the system, which I don't think really rises to the level of the criminal justice system at all. You call it constitutional apartheid, a better way to say it you have is a, a, a police regime. And so to me, the starting point, for me, the starting point is how do we uh, disempower the police from doing what they're doing? Now, what empowers them our law, uh, is the, this, this concept of the drug war. There's no such thing as a war against drugs. As Kenneth Nunn pointed out, and many have pointed out, you don't fight a war against inanimate objects. You fight a war against communities. So what you have is, is, is not a drug war, it's a war against in the class. Now, that war is prosecuted based on certain laws, which, uh, which now, for example, if you smoke, if you use, if you use crack cocaine, you, you probably will go to jail. 95% of the people 95% of people who are in prison for 
cocaine are black, something like that. I don't have to say exactly right, but the, 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 the point is, is that if, you, if you're white and use cocaine, you'll probably get rehab. If you're black and use it, you go to prison. And so this, this, is, there's a, this works, this is not an, act, not an accident. The blacks are, have been identified as the problem. We, that is the narrative, that we are the problem. Now, which means we also need a cultural change. But the, the means by which we can most quickly, or at least begin to get at this, is we need to get rid of laws which criminalize the, the simple possession of crack cocaine and or marijuana. Those laws should not exist. They have no right to exist. Uh, at one point in, in a criminal law, we used to argue that the reason you have possession laws is simply to go after black people. Well, I think that is what, why you have uh, If I could cut through it. So the, the, that's my starting point. We need to look at statutes and laws which uh, empower the police to subjugate or subordinate a group of people, target communities. Second thing we need to do, and this is very basic to my framework, I see the problem as one of power. Black communities have no social, political, economic power. Uh, they have representatives, but the representatives usually represent the middle class, not the people who are in the underclass. The, uh, the, the, the first thing that needs to happen in terms of thinking about how the police can be, can be changed, you can't change the police, but what you could do is you could give the people in those local communities the power to control police. You could give them the power to decide who the police chief is, what, where should they be employed, how should they be deployed, should they have guns, should they arrest someone because they have a, have a joint or, or sell Lucy's. So I think that you need new structures in that community which allow the people in those communities to control the police. You may need to get rid of laws which criminalize, uh, which supposedly criminalize drugs, but what we're really doing is criminalizing the black underclass. So, so that's just the first point that my starting point is, is that the black community doesn't have a criminal justice system. They have a police regime and that police regime is operationalized by drug laws and laws like the, the, the provide something called the war against crime. We have people in the black communities who are arrested for riding a bicycle without a belt, without a, a, a registration, for riding a bicycle without a, re, a, a registration or arrested in Fort Lauderdale in the black community, nowhere else. So what I want to see is to take away laws which allow, which allow that to happen. Now, the problem with defunding the police is, is that what I want to see is funding. I want to see black communities where there are opportunities for people to have jobs, where there are opportunities for people to go to school, where, where they have hope, where they have a reason to believe that they matter. Now, if you, if, if you look at the, the two kinds of violence in black community, two kinds of ways black people die, one by police, but the most common way is by black people killing each other in those, and these are mostly, these communities are so segregated, you can say they are almost entirely. So to me, what you need to do is not just look at the violence that happens because of police. Look at the violence that happens when black people kill each other because that is state-sponsored as well. It is not private violence. I don't accept the private public distinction between police shootings and people. You see, the problem is, is that the, 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 it's the structure of society itself that sets in motion the violence in those communities. This is structural violence. When, when a black uh, drug dealer goes to get the war with another drug dealer, that's structural violence. He had, he, they, they, they get into the game, as they call it, because they have no economic opportunities. And so you put something, uh, uh, I don't know how much a, a, a kilo of cocaine is worth, maybe it's worth $30,000. You put that in a community where people don't make $30,000 a year, they're going to fight over it. And so that's, it's the structured society that creates the situation where they choose that game. And it, so to me, we need to focus on two things. One, how do we create a criminal justice system, which does not now exist in those communities? We have constitutional apartheid, uh, not a real criminal justice system. And the second thing is, is that how do we create a situation in those communities so that there won't have to be any violence? way of any kind. And I think much of the violence is driven by economic lack, lack of political power, lack and, and social stigma. If we, I think at that point we begin, and that doesn't take away from 
the need to think about police. I, I'm not trying to say we shouldn't have those conversations or those conversations are any less important. But it's just for me, the starting point is how do we change the situation where the, where the laws that are supposed to be protecting everybody are being used to target black communities for military style COVID campaigns? How do we create a situation where people in those communities instead of killing each other have hope for the future and, and, can, and can participate as citizens? Because I think our ability to participate as citizens to some extent is shackled, was shackled by a, a socioeconomic divide which has replaced the color line. Let me stop here. I don't know how much Appreciate I appreciate that. Say no, it was a lot. You answered my question and then some. And so I think it's important at the risk of being persnickety to underscore three things that I noted. Uh, one is for anyone that heard the articulation of acknowledging the need to lean into it, further study and understand why black people kill black people. It is not a uh, affirmation of the idea of black on black crime. It is a reminder that crime is localized. And because of hypersegregation, Black people live in other communities, primarily with other Black people. And as a result of lack of access to economic opportunities, violence happens. That's one. Um, the second thing is I want to celebrate the community of intellectuals that you are a member of, Dr. Jones, as you celebrate ours. Um, for those who um, are not steeped in understanding the significance of that community, I would point you to what we often refer to in the academy as critical race theory. Um, Derek Bell is a foundational scholar, as is Professor Jones, as is Kimberly Crenshaw. I mean, in particular, Derek Bell offers up a principle of racial realism. Uh, I often think of it as radical racial realism, which is an acknowledgement, at least in the United States, that our country, including our constitution and the systems that we um, engage with and that help to order our society, in this context, the prison industrial complex, the policing systems that have emerged as, uh, out of them, um, are all structured in ways that are designed to maintain the supremacy of white people at the expense of oppressing non-white people. Um, and so there's a lot of research that has been done to help us apply a critical lens uh, to these conversations. And I wanna offer that up um, for everyone to digest. Um, and then the third thing is that there was a question that has been posed um, in the Q&A, please keep it coming. Um, that is, uh, what is, the, um, the end goal, what's the goal of defunding long-term reduction of crime, uh, improving the lives of potential criminals or others? Um, this was offered by Daniel. Um, and so I wanna just pull out that I heard the response to that from you, uh, Professor Jones, being the creation of an actual criminal justice system. Yeah. Uh, where justice is equitably accessed by people um, and where it means that when black people are murdered by police, um, justice isn't the hope that they might be indicted. Um, that actually works in ways that it otherwise does. Is that accurate? Yes, except that I think that if we had a real criminal justice system, the, it, it would almost, it would be rare. I mean, when have we heard of a white person being killed in their police sleep by police shooting uh, multiple times through their door while they're asleep? I, I don't know. I mean, if, if, if we had a real criminal justice system, this wouldn't happen. That means we have a new culture, that we have a, have a, a new power structure. So yes, but absolutely yes. It's just that I think that, that the, the world that we live in is created by the fact that the power relationships uh, have, have not changed in 50 years. They've been created by the fact that the same stereotypes that existed in slavery uh, have continued to exist. They've just been updated. Uh, in the slavery, they called us beasts. Today, they call us urban thugs. These are, they, they've just updated the stereotypes, but we still live in what I'll call a culture of fear. Uh, and, and, and that is what drives much of it. Uh, it it's, it's a culture, not just an individual policeman. There's a culture of fear, sometimes hatred, but it's a culture of stereotype. Uh, every black person who goes out in the street is vulnerable to those stereotypes, whether you're a PhD or a brother without it or a sister without a job. Yeah. Uh, and then similarly, I also heard a part of your response to be the establishment of systems that address violence, uh, violence that mostly stems from uh, economic lack of opportunity. And then Ajane offered up to me an answer to that question in talking about providing resources to meet unmet community needs. Ajane, is that accurate in terms of possibly your response to that question? Oh, that's absolutely accurate. I mean, from the, you know, the education, quality education, job readiness, job opportunities and access to those jobs through transportation and, you know, investment in communities. Um, I mean, the whole gamut, um, uh, mental uh, health care, mental health care, you know, all of those things. Absolutely. 
I appreciate that. Uh, uh, Senator Akbar, let's tap you in. First, I want to acknowledge the significance of your leadership uh, as a woman of color, uh, especially in the great state of Tennessee. So just thank you for all that you do and don't get uh, acknowledgement for, period, full stop. Uh, I want to invite you in and just ask your reflections. I am uh, curious about how you are making sense of this, uh, what your answer to the question of what the long-term goals of um, abolishment are or might be, and in particular, how you, as someone who has the responsibility of shaping policy to inform practice, um, how are you thinking about all of these conversations about reform, abolishment, um, or any space in between? Well, first of all, um, thank you. And yes, I am down here in Tennessee, uh, one of six Democrats in the state Senate. <laughs> so we are in a super minority. So it definitely every day is a um, challenge. Uh, but I am super excited to be on the panel with soon to be Dr. Clemens and of course with uh, Professor and Dr. Jones and of course soon to be Dr. Jones. Um, uh, this has been a topic that has kind of dominated our summer. So our legislature reconvened in June because we recessed in March around COVID. And we had protesters who were, um, and I wanna say protesters, I really wanna use that term loosely because they were really just demonstrating and, and giving, they were not, um, you know, they were not uh, aggressive. They were not breaking any laws, but they were still targeted by our general assembly. Um, they had two little tents up, like a, not even a tent, a canopy. And our General Assembly, when we came back in August for a special session, decided to pass legislation that would criminalize them, that would make them convicted felons for camping out on camping out on state property beyond 10 p.m. Um, that was one of the most ridiculous days that I've ever experienced in the General Assembly, and I think it speaks to a greater uh, disregard uh, for the concept that there is a problem with policing. Now, at the same time, our governor announced a task force to study policing. And I'm thinking, okay, so you're signing into law something that makes someone a felon that takes away the rights of a young person simply for exercising their constitutional rights. There was never this level of targeting when we had people marching around with AK-47s uh, because they wanted to make sure we had uh, open carry, which is inherently just ridiculous and, in and dangerous. Um, and then also I, I serve as a Senate caucus chair. So my goal is to recruit candidates and raise money and also counteract the narratives that the Republican party is pushing. In this particular situation, every single candidate that we ran, they, the uh, majority party sent out mailers that showed they wanna defund the police and it had a car on fire or something like that and said they wanna bring their big city values down to our communities. Um, they aggressively leaned into the notion of defunding the police is a discussion that means there will be absolute anarchy, uh, which is simply not true. And I've had to explain to so many of my colleagues, that's not what the discussion is. The real discussion is about reallocation of resources. When I'm, I represent downtown Memphis and I was driving home one day and I came across a gentleman who was not fully clothed and he was walking down the street and then he sat down on the curb. Now I wanna be able to call someone in a mental health arena that can help him. If I call law enforcement, we don't know what sort of situation he's in and what sort of interaction it will lead to. Will he be criminalized for an issue that he's clearly having some sort of mental health crisis? Uh, will there be violence? I think that that is uh, not having this alternative really is the genesis of our discussion. Um, there are a couple of things that I, I believe, I know that there's, President Obama of course uh, started a firestorm of a uh, conversation around saying that defund the police, uh, you know, has kind of a negative connotation and stops the conversation. Well, I will say this, um, being in a Republican controlled state, it is difficult when you say that. Um, but I do still think that you have to kick the door in on conversations sometimes. Um, and then when you actually have those nuanced discussions that actually lead to real policy change, then you can say, hey, well, what I'm really talking about is this. The majority of a city's budget goes to a police department. And for me, a budget is a moral document. So if you are investing in certain aspects of, of our community and not in others, uh, then it shows where your priorities are. So instead, uh, we need to look at ways where we have alternatives, like a nonviolence response team, uh, like if you have someone where there's a domestic situation, uh, particularly between juveniles, that you have the tools uh, that, are, that are needed to, one, 
stop the situation, but two, give them the support that they need. Uh, for me, a, a big part of my work in the General Assembly is also around education. And I believe uh, that that truly is the investment uh, that needs to be made that will have a, a wide range of changes. One, early childhood education, looking at zero to five, you know, five and beyond, third grade, and then also beyond. How can we invest so that we are stopping adverse childhood experiences before they even begin? How can we approach our homes in a two-generational way where we're saying, hey, we can help children, but we also need to help the household, stabilize the household so that they have the education they need to be able to get a good job. They have the mental health support they need to break these cycles. And they also have transportation to get to these jobs. It is a big deal and a big problem in our communities. Um, we've had this great debate about funding early childhood education in Tennessee. Some of my colleagues have said the government has our children long enough. And I think, um, hello, that is not a, an, an, a good, a good response. And then some of them will say, well, the parents have the responsibility of preparing them for kindergarten. Well, if a parent is working or a parent themselves is not prepared, uh, then how do we get to that next step? But I say all this to say, if we can provide an environment where people are not just trying to survive all the time, but they're thriving, uh, that they have the tools that they need to step into a real career where their alternative will not be getting involved in the criminal system, where they actually are able to have better health outcomes because they are not dealing with this trauma and this, this deep rooted mental health issue that issues that are not being addressed because of the stigma around it. I mean, where they feel valued, where we feel valued in our communities, uh, where Memphis is a majority black city, 67% black. Our mayor's a white man, our member of Congress is a white man, but I will tell you this, at one point, black folks were in every single office from mayor, county mayor, member of Congress, school board, city council, nothing changed. Black wealth went down, black contracting went down. Uh, so we have to look at it from a holistic approach. Otherwise, I think that violence will continue to permeate our communities and our relationship with our police departments will continue to be negative. I'm on a task force called Reimagining Policing with uh, the city of Memphis. They're trying to kind of follow the Atlanta model. Um, and we have had discussions. We had a community discussion. Um, each member of the task force had to lead one. And for me, I keep pressuring the mayor and saying, listen, this to me, I'm not doing this because I want to say, put this on my resume. Like I have community members that I, I have to represent and I wanna make sure that we actually have real change, that we actually look at how we're funding our police department, that we stop getting away from this mythical, we have to have 2,500 police officers in our city, otherwise we will continue to have violence. An increase in police officers is not the answer, that we have to have harsher uh, penalties on certain gun crimes, we cannot incarcerate our way out of crime. It has not worked. Tennessee, unlike most states, has had an increase in our prison population. In 2018, we crossed $1 billion in funding. Uh, so we are also allegedly reimagining what that looks like and primarily because it costs too much. So I tell my colleagues, look, <laughs> y'all care about the money. I care about the people. It doesn't matter if we can get to A plus B can get to C. I'm, I'm fine with that. Uh, so I think that the opportunity is right, but I do think messaging is important. And I think we have to look at it from a holistic way. Uh, I think like Ajane said, and also like Dr. Jones said, we have to create a situation where we don't need uh, law enforcement intervention. And if we do have law enforcement intervention, it has to be right. I love what Colorado did and myself and another representative, um, we filed this legislation. We've been talking to the governor about it where you really look at how deadly force is used, where you pierce through this immunity that police officers have, and where you also are willing to invest in communities so that we don't even get to this point. So we'll see. Again, Tennessee is um, Tennessee, is Tennessee, uh, but at least our governor has indicated he wants to have these discussions. Uh, we'll keep pressuring them to make sure something happens. Again, I want to say thank you for your work. <laughs> I wish that uh, the majority of uh, state and local uh, and national legislatures uh, had those guiding principles. Uh, and uh, I can say much more about that. I will just say thank you for your work. Uh, I want to highlight two things that you spoke to uh, that have come up in both the Q&A and the chat. Um, and one is around messaging, and the other point related to that is around reimagining. Um, and so there's been a number of different ways that people in the chat have acknowledged that the phrase defund the police 
um, is, in, uh, is often felt, received in problematic ways. Um, and so acknowledging that, the question to you, Senator Akbari, and then to others are, have you thought about a way to replace it? So for example, um, someone suggested maybe refund the police, uh, but I'm wondering if, if any of you have done that thought work around uh, what we might be calling or messaging this. I'm also looking to you, Dr. Jones. Um, the second part of this is the reimagining. Um, there's a question that I want to read because I think that it is uh, precise in illustrating um, the point here. Um, and so Heidi says, police are still needed to help protect the community when needed. Uh, what I think is needed is massive police reform and a revision of policies and procedures that are being abused by those in power. I agree with the needs to be mass, I agree that there need to be massive changes to ensure everyone is treated fairly. But if there are no police to enforce the laws, why do we have laws? Uh, if there's a move to defund the police and move toward reforming laws next, or is the move to defund the police and then move to reforming the laws next? And then last, if we reallocate resources to remove the resources from police departments, there will be no money for them to operate. Um, and so what I feel in this question and then in some others is this real angst around not having the space, the resources, the support to imagine a world where police don't exist and a visceral response to the, the, the thinking around that loss of protection. I want to underscore that I don't know the race or the place of Heidi, but to Dr. Jones's point, I would imagine that Heidi is not a person of color or lives in one of these communities because if, if Heidi were a person, I think the question would have been reframed to acknowledge that police often don't bring us protection, um, even when we are threatened or experiencing violence. Um, and so again, the statement or restatement of the questions are any thoughts around reframing um, the message around defund uh, and then any thoughts around this challenge with imagining a world where police don't exist in the way in which we've known them um, and an acknowledgement that the police again grew out of the KKK um, and desires to control black bodies um, in ways that were not possible after the formal end of enslavement um, here in the United States. Um, so Senator Akbari, I would like for you to respond and then we'll make space for others. Certainly, and I think when we're talking about reallocation of funds, we're not talking about police departments operating at a deficit. We're saying some of the things that they're doing right now in the community, they should not be doing. They should not be responsible for our mental health responses. There are certain domestic situations they should not be responsible for. It's just like, um, I, I read an article that talked about how police departments used to be responsible for being paramedics of sorts. And it, it was poor outcomes. Most people, by the time they got to the hospital, they were already, they'd already passed on. And so as that division that functioned as an, an EMT kept getting funded more, it was separated into its own division. That's what we're talking about separating out duty so that there's not this responsibility that goes beyond, I think, what a police department is, is supposed to be doing. Also, we have to change this notion that police officers are protecting and serving. Some of them are a sword and not a shield. And that is a problem. When you have big, big portions of the community that feel that calling the police is not going to be something that's going to end well for them, uh, that's a problem. Uh, so we can say, you know, we don't want to get rid of all police officers. No, I don't want to do that. I want to make sure that from the academy on, you have sincere, like real mental health screenings. There are some people who should not be police officers, just like there are some people who should not be teachers, elected officials, lawyers, doctors, anything you can think of. It is not anti-law enforcement to say these people should not be in law enforcement. Uh, their training needs to have a holistic approach to their community, right? You cannot patrol a community that you are afraid of and people that you are afraid of. And your first and most most uh, prominent interactions with people of color cannot be when you are coming to arrest them. Um, it has to be more of a community-based, I believe, um, almost like a uh, where, where you're immersed in that community. I think also in training, we have to do some sincere implicit bias training. Uh, the, to, to, to argue that that does not exist, whether we're talking about black officers, white officers, whatever, any spectrum, uh, people have certain biases. I've seen African-American folks be treated worse by black cops than anybody sometimes. So it's not just a racial issue, it's a mindset issue. But I think it goes to screening before they ever get there, training, 
and then also continuing training. As an attorney, I have to take 15 hours of continuing legal education every single year. I know police officers have to do additional training, but where are these checkups to make sure that they have not slipped? Where are these national databases where we can keep track of, hey, this officer, because I live in Memphis, I can see Arkansas, not to be Sarah Palin, but I can see Arkansas from my living room, okay? And if you commit or you're a bad officer in Arkansas, you can come right over to Tennessee and get a job or go right to Mississippi, which is right next door as well. And so I think there has to be a, a collaboration of state, local, and federal, just like you saw in the 90s where there was this move from the federal government to help states, one, overly criminalized through our just through our laws, our criminal justice laws, and then also police departments to militarize. There were funds and incentives for that. You have to have the reverse. You have to fund and incentivize from a federal level departments that are willing to reimagine what it looks like to be an officer in their community for states that are willing to reimagine what laws on the books are so that you don't have prisons that are overcrowded. Uh, there are some rural communities that rely completely, they, all their jobs in their community is based on that one prison. And so there's an incentive to make sure that stays full. We have to move away from that so that we can move other industries into those communities. And, and we talked about this a lot on the Biden uh, Sanders task force, like what can be done on a federal level uh, so that we can incentivize local and state governments to, to look differently. And, I, and, and I'm here for, and I think that the Biden administration has indicated they are too. I want to under, underscore what Stephanie is saying in the chat, which is Senator Akbari. I just want to chime in and compliment you. You are such an engaging and eloquent speaker in your community and our country is so lucky to have you. Uh, they're lucky to have you represent them. Um, I echo that. Um, Ajane, soon to be Dr. Clement, um, Belasia, I believe, uh, got that right. If I got it wrong, please let me know. What have you noticed is the most effective in terms of messaging to build a coalition of people interested in demilitarizing um, and prioritizing social services? Um, this person is also interested in your thoughts about um, still my president, forever my president, Barack Hussein Obama, so watch what you say about him. Um, but his recent remarks about defunding the police uh, wasn't too divisive or as he would say, divisive. She's you know, I, I think, you know, this whole, it's interesting because uh, if you look at some of the more recent statements that he's made, apparently they're more um, in support of the, the policies that are implicated by defunding the police, even if he doesn't like the, the, the sort of term of it. I don't, um, I'm not really, invested um, so much in the term, but I will note it's, this is very similar to the conversations around Black Lives Matter, um, that terminology. <clears throat> and, um, and so, you know, it might be a question of time and like education and the getting people to understand the intent. Um, and so just, you know, people being patient, um, but I'm not, you know, personally invested one way or the other in the, in the, in the naming, I think, um, you know, it's going to really come down to um, the substance. Um, I'll say that, um, you know, with militarization, because there was a question on demilitarizing the police, that started to happen under the Obama administration uh, through executive order uh, that was promptly reversed. It was one of the earliest acts of the Trump administration to beef that back up. Um, and I would expect that in the new administration, uh, that would be uh, again reversed and, uh, you know, potentially um, through congressional action, um, uh, some, some progress on that as well. I just wanna highlight a couple of, um, of evidence-based <clears throat> uh, models to come forward for the defunding the police piece, because um, I, I agree with everything that's been said in terms of um, reduction of, of policy violence. Um, in some of those broader early childhood education, investments, um, education, transportation, uh, community uh, development, things of, the, of that sort. Um, but um, until we can get to some of those universal type of policies, um, there are some targeted, a couple of targeted approaches that have uh, reduced uh, homicides and attempted homicides by as much as 40 to 70% in some communities. And so Dr. Gary Slutkin um, is an epidemiologist who actually combated um, cholera, tuberculosis, um, and refugee camps abroad, and then pioneered this model, um, Chicago ceasefire, which um, he's later scaled up under the Cure Violence um, Global Program. And so, um, and so basically, you're going to target the most affected areas, 
um, and then take po fo folks who are from the community <clears throat> Um, and train them on some, you know, persuasion. They're still in these networks. They are keeping tabs on retaliation and attempted retaliation. And then they're intervening, they're mediating with the support of outreach workers who are then connecting those high-risk populations to, um, to sort of, uh, you know, therapy, um, tra uh, job training, job, job preparation, things like that. Um, and then, uh, and then, and then following up on, on them. And that's been very successful. Um, <clears throat> oh, also, uh, changing community norms so that people, um, really start to kind of internalize this, this idea that it's not okay to just, you know, go to violence in order to resolve your problems. Um, and then in Richmond, California, which had one of the nation's worst homicide rates, uh, Devon Bagen was hired to lead the city's new Office of Neighborhood Safety, which was loosely piloted on this cure violence model, but taken a bit further. And so um, because he you know, was able to show that the vast majority of shootings in the community were really the small group of people, he convinced um, the city to invest in these wraparound services for, for high-risk folks. Um, and embedded them in a fellowship program, you know, where they're getting, um, where they're getting uh, therapy, where they're learning to build healthy relationships, um, where they're having mentorship with elders, and even paid a thousand dollars a month, that sort of financially stabilized um, them and their families to stay out of trouble for up to nine months um, later. And so, certainly, it's not without its critics, um, but it's a heck of a lot cheaper than the status quo. Um, you know, when you're counting the costs both financially and in terms of uh, blood, sweat, and tears. Um, you know, to Senator Agbari's point, there are some really critical, um, really critical uh, reforms that are direct for policing. And so, um, so this gets at the, you know, like uh, Professor Jones was saying, uh, you know, that, that violence interrupters piece goes to the fact that, um, that police aren't doing as well as we would expect and hope um, for preventing, preventing violent crime, right? So that's doing a much better job than that. Um, however, even when, um, even when it occurs, I mean, police are largely reactive and in the United States, um, nationally, uh, it's been found that um, that that folks are arrested for for where in cases where there's a white victim only about 63 percent of the time, where there's a black victim nationally, folks are arrested about 47 percent of the time, and this is actually worse in um, many communities uh, like Chicago, for example, where those clearance rates drop all the way to 22 percent. Now, Boston Police Department um, has uh, created an intervention that boosted those clearance rates by looking at some of the gaps in their own um, processes and forensic practices, um, and were able to, in a pretty short period of time, one to three years, um, improve their clearance rates by almost 10%. Um, and so that's something that, um, you know, that can be replicated, but it's more of, uh, you know, looking at uh, an agency's own gaps um, and, and, and coming up with something tailor-made. So um, that's gonna go to the, you know, increased justice um, and, then, um, and then certainly some more accountability around um, police violence. Um, and, you know, we can, we can get into that a little bit later or I can, uh, you know, put some, put some um, uh, resources in the chat, but I have like several more, you know, specific kinds of institutional policing reforms. I, I encourage everyone to uh, engage in the chat. Please share the resources that you've mentioned uh, and or that have come to mind. Uh, I want to manage everyone's expectations, given my responsibility in this. We have about 10, maybe 15 minutes if we push it left um, to have this conversation. I think this is an indication to the planners that we need more time to have this discussion and or have a follow-up um, dialogue. I wanna say thank you to everyone who has been engaging uh, in the chat as well as in the Q&A box. I've been doing my best to try and respond to them and synthesize the questions that have been raised. And I will honor that we don't have enough time to meaningfully respond to all of them. And so I apologize in advance. I hope you will blame my head and not my heart. Dr. Jones, um, I wanna acknowledge that something that has been referenced that we will not have time to go into in depth is the role of militarization of federal and state police. And so I just wanna highlight for folks um, that there are active articles now talking about 
um, studies that allege that the Trump administration used unreliable data to justify a 2017 executive order that Ajene referenced that bolstered the Pentagon giveaway program by mm. rolling back restrictions of the type of milita military equipment that can be distributed to police departments. And so not only is there an incentive to arrest, but they're also giving away resources that support this militarization of communities that are often coded by color. Um, and so I want to acknowledge that, and I want to offer you space to respond to three things if you can. Uh, so one is this broader conversation about militarization um, and the role of state-sanctioned violence when we think about defunding. The second is the role of other actors. So there have been at least two uh, interventions in the chat that uh, acknowledge and name the role of district attorneys, right? Police don't act independent. They are often protected by district attorneys. They are also protected by unions. Um, and so there was a specific question about strategies that you might be aware of or others might be aware of to overcome those obstacles that again exist as a result of what black feminists would refer to as the matrix of domination, the science systems and symbols that allow all of these things to be omnipresent and invisible at the same time. Um, and then the third is where Ajane was is, please offer up any resources or recommendations you have as we acknowledge that we're gonna be concluding uh, the conversation soon. Well, first of all, thank you for this wonderful panel. I feel like I'm in, I'm in a community of revolutionary minded people. I hope you understand that word as a compliment. Uh, so you talked about militarization and I think that that is where we are. I think that uh, the relationship that the police have with black communities around the country is one in which they see people in most communities as them and uh, everybody else is us. Now, also a framework that I use is I'm, I'm not a universalist. I think that the problems that we are seeing depend on context. The context of people living in the city is much worse than the context for someone who lives in Beverly Hills. Black person in the Beverly Hills. The the the, milk, the the what we've done since 1980 is we have spent a trillion dollars on a so-called war on drugs, which has amounted in large part to giving police actual military equipment from uh, tanks, literally tanks, to uh, vehicles which carry you know sort of the SWAT team vehicles you see. SWAT was a product of the drug war. And another thing that they have, for example, had something called Comstat. And what Comstat is computer-assisted policing. And so it's, it's literally a military approach to policing in which you look to where the crime is. And where the crime is, that's where they want to see change. And what that change really means is that's where they're going to demand that police make arrests. And so then they're rewarded with money for the number of arrests they make. So the, the militarization of policing and mass incarceration are two sides of one coin. To talk about demilitarization really, in my opinion, means we need to end the drug war. We need to end the war on crime. If we do that, we've come a long way. Uh, you talked about the role of district attorneys. And I think that anyone who's, who is a district attorney now is part of a criminal justice system, if you call it that, which administers, uh, so it's like, like a caste system. And so what I would love to see district attorneys do is to come to whether it's a law school or wherever, and, and, and listen to the other side. They, they should be like a one day a month in which they listen to the community complain about how bad they're treated and, and listen seriously to the solutions that they have. One solution that I want to offer right now is there should be a panel in every city and every community of people to review the charges. What typically happens is, if we, let's say that you, you're walking down the street with your friend and your friend is wearing saggy pants and the police think he's a drug dealer. They arrest him, whoever's with him, he's arrested for selling drugs. They may find a, an ounce of marijuana and they arrest the friend for being with him. They say, well, you're trying to buy from him. So it's a, it's a, it's a factory in which they are, a assembly line in which they're arresting people. So what should happen is, at the very least, there should be a panel. And every time a charge is filed, whether it's a judge or a lawyer should be on the panel, they should look at it to see if there is really any basis for anyone being arrested. And these innocent panels would have the power to dismiss charges. And so I think that one of the things that needs to happen, you need, you need procedural safeguards to prevent people from being part of this system. Uh, and it, you know, was systemically arresting, was systemically uh, abusing this community, maybe that would help. That's one thing. I think another thing that helps the district attorneys to come out of their, their, their tower 
and listen to people uh, and adopt some of the reforms. But my idea is, that, at least in general, that we need to democratize the process. Uh, you know, for example, we, you, there's a central control of the police. Decentralize that, give people power. And not just to do that with police, but with schools. I think that people from the community should have some control over the curriculum and, and student-teacher ratios and where does the money go? So, so we still have a caste system. People, Jesse Jones. Jesse Jones, there's a question. I don't want to cut you off, but I am mindful yeah. of time, so I'm doing it with love. Is yeah. there a state or locality that uses such a panel uh, like the one that you've described? Well, the closest they came to it is in Baltimore, where they have a, a an individual who is like a master who looks at the stops, looks at the arrests, and he tries to decide whether the racism that they were found guilty of is still going on. So they do have an official who does it. I think it should be done by members of the community with a legal advisor. So, that, so you do have something where there has been a finding of systemic racism, you do have these structures, but they should be everywhere and that they should be staffed by the community. Related to that, really quickly, and I want to, again, encourage you all to answer uh, in, in Twitter sound bites, not the like new Twitter, but like the early, you only had 70 characters, Twitter. Um, can anyone address or offer up their thoughts around defunding ICE, um, specifically detention centers, uh, any connections to that um, form of state uh, enforced violence that anybody wants to speak to quickly? Well, if nothing else, I think that they need to stop relying on local law enforcement for enforcement of their uh, federal laws or of, 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 of going out and getting people. But I think that uh, it needs to be completely rethought. I mean, obviously putting children in cages, separating people and families at the border, uh, this, that is just ridiculous. And so it cannot continue to function in its current capacity. Uh, before you uh, unmute our mutual mic again, there was a question that was posed specifically to you, um, Senator Akbari, uh, and it's a question, I'll paraphrase it because I can no longer find it, is um, do you feel that the conversation around defunding the police or maybe the larger uh, request for demanding an acknowledgement of the humanity of Black lives um, is specific to Black folks? Like, should this conversation remain explicit in acknowledging and naming Black folks or do you think that there's a need to and a benefit of making it more expansive uh, and adopting, for example, language that I hate, uh, like POC, which again, dilutes the focus on uh, blackness and anti-blackness. So what are you thinking about um, communal politics in that regard? Well, certainly I think it should involve all marginalized people or those who are finding themselves being systemically abused by police force. Um, of course, we have our, our, our brown brothers and sisters in our communities that are subject to some of the same issues. Uh, but I, so I, I think it's there's room for it to be broad, but I do think at the same time, we have to acknowledge the long history of police abuse, specifically towards the black community. I appreciate you. Uh, this is a reminder from one of my mentors, uh, Professor Freeman Rabowski, who was the president of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, who says that we should not be beholden to the tyranny of either or, but uh, celebrate the beauty and liberation of both and. Um, so I appreciate you modeling that in response to that question. My last question to the panel uh, before we land this plane acknowledges that there were a number of questions about our babies. Um, and so uh, both you, Ajane, and you, Senator Akbari, uh, spoke to my heart. I, I don't know if people know, but I taught kindergarten and third grade. I do a lot of work around the need to protect and teach the babies. Um, my nails are painted in part because students are still being suspended uh, for painting their nails in school and having their gender policed. Um, mm -hmm. And so my question to you is, when thinking about this conversation um, and the opportunities that exist in order for us to reduce um, policy violence, um, and provide reparations. We could probably have a whole nother panel on what repar reparations means and how it can show up in this context. But for me, I'll use it in a pure sense just to acknowledge a need for repair and redressment of harms. Um, what's your vision for how these conversations will affect the lives of our babies? Um, again, acknowledging as sociologist Asa Hilliard said, um, all of our babies are geniuses. Um, I would add that not a single one of them asked to be born. Um, and so what's your vision for the future and how would you invite um, those who have joined us, the 337 participants who are active in this moment and those who will access this uh, virtually later? Um, what's your invitation for them to enter the arena and otherwise meaningfully engage in this work? Um, let's start with you, Senator Akbari, and we'll go in reverse order in the way in which we started. Well, on a most simple level, even our, our search for our new police chief, we have a group of young teenagers who have asked to be a part of the committee. Uh, 
Uh, so I think one, listening and acknowledging that young people have a voice, but also for me in my work, I've tried to focus on school discipline and the over-discipline of kindergartners, preschoolers, the over-discipline of black girls and black boys. Uh, and for me, I think that plays a pivotal role. Uh, I think that when you teach someone and it's, it's this Im implicit ingrained in who they are, um, that they are bad versus good, uh, then it's a problem. Uh, so I'd like to see one more investment in in kind of moving away from exclusionary discipline and this concept of what it means to to have um, have conflict and more towards a restorative justice model, but then also keeping young people engaged. They have something to say, and they're absolutely brilliant. Professor Jones. Well, one thing I would love to see, and I think the best way we can invite them is to have classes in high schools, classes in uh, uh, pu all public schools, which deal with issues of justice, which take situations of people lives, use narratives, use stories, in which they have to confront some of the things that have happened. Let them see what happened. Let them talk about, well, what's the issue? What's the problem? But there should be some class called the social justice class, in which they have to confront these questions. And there should be an opportunity for people who actually experience these injustices, people who are unjustly convicted, someone uh, who may have lost a loved one to the murder by a policeman. They, they, so we, we need to have, as part of our curriculum, a focus on these issues of justice and to begin early to give them the tools and hopefully the inspiration to try to address these, these critical issues. Thank you for naming restorative justice. Uh, Dr. Clemens, uh, last word goes to you, just to take us home. Thank you so much, David. Um, I just love the comments that were made about the babies. I mean, um, you know, we have to acknowledge that the that, that, that this violence that's occurring um, is, is, is happening in the womb um, to babies and after they're born. Um, and it continues to the most critical time um, where there's a sort of existential threat to their existence and that's as teenagers, that's as teenagers and young adults. And I think that this um, looking at, looking at uh, policing and the criminal justice system through the lens of childhood is actually a, a fantastic idea. And then we can see that if we just look at each of those stages from how pregnant black women, for example, are treated um, to what happened to those babies when they're starting to, to turn into teenagers that are mistaken for adults. Um, if we can examine that and sort of look every stage of that way, I think we'll have far more just and equitable policies that preserve many more lives. I agree. Uh, and again, I want to say thank you. Uh, thank you to the team at the German Marshall Fund for organizing this convening. Thank you to this all-star panel who made my job and responsibilities as a moderator incredibly easy. Thank you to you, Dr. Clements, to you, Professor Jones, and to you, Senator Akbari, for your leadership for all of the things that you do that get acknowledged and for the many things that you do that don't get acknowledged. And finally, thank you to all of the attendees. Uh, you were incredibly active in the chat. I try to do my best to get as many of the questions answered as possible um, and know that this was simply an introduction. So I encourage you to read everyone's bios, uh, to find ways to engage with them via social media, um, follow them, find ways to support them and seek to do no harm in that process. And wherever possible, please consider the National Black Justice Coalition the team that I have the pleasure of quarterbacking a resource in this work. Um, if we find ways to solve this problem uh, transatlantically, we can be a model for the rest of the world. Um, so thank you. I'll turn this back over to NG. Thank you so much, David, for moderating the session. And thank you to all the panelists. Um, you know, I can't help but read the comments that are coming in directly to the panelists, just expressing love and support and accolades and kind of nodding my head um, because, you know, many of us met through the leadership program sponsored by the German Marshall Fund. And what's wonderful about those programs is not just the quality of, um, of the trainings, but also the people selected to be part of it. And I think that was reflected directly um, in today's discussion. And I was reminded of that as I was reading people's reactions as well. Um, so I'm grateful for the fact that you made yourselves available to be part of this important conversation. And I'm also grateful for all the people who actually um, joined and tuned in. And I, I see 
the, um, the requests that are being made to actually share these insights and voices with a broader swath of the public. I want to note that um, a copy of the program recording, the transcript, will be distributed to each of the registrants um, after the summit, and I encourage you to share it with your networks um, so that way we can uh, educate more people. Um, and we hope to have follow-up discussions about these issues because this is only the beginning of the conversation. So thank you to all. Um, I hope you'll be joining us for our next session, which will start in about five minutes, that will explore hate crimes. So thank you again, um, and I hope to